in half an hour, Eamon Andrews is back with his big red book and those famous opening words. And then at half past seven, we're back down Coronation Street with the Carry On Laughing team here at eight o'clock. But now on STV, it's time for David Glencourse with this week's report. Half past eight in the morning at Edinburgh's Waverley Station and the pipes and drums ring out for a very special occasion in army history. These men belong to the oldest regiment in Britain and they're about to travel to a secret venue for a rather exclusive birthday party. For today, the 28th of March, 1983, the Royal Scots, the 1st Regiment of Foot and Senior Line Regiment in the British Army are 350 years old. By tradition, the Royal Scots take pride of place on the right of any battle and appropriately the train waiting at the London platform has been named right of the line for the day. Lieutenant General Sir David Young, a former Royal Scots Colonel, blows the whistle for the train to depart. Some of the men travelling south have fought on the bloody battlefields of France and Flanders. Some have seen action at Dunkirk, Burma, Korea and Aden. Others are just back from service in Northern Ireland. They're all part of a spirit and tradition that goes right back to 1633, when a Scottish soldier of fortune made the moves which created the regiment. Sir John Hepburn, from East Lothian and common with many adventurous Scots of his day, was prepared to hire himself and his sword to any king in Europe, providing he wasn't serving an enemy of his country. Hepburn was a most colourful character. He was born about 1600. He is known to have been a soldier of fortune in Europe at the age of 20. By the age of 25, he was commanding a battalion, and by the age of 29, he was a brigade commander fighting for that very famous soldier king of Sweden, Gustavus Adolphus, the second. Uh, in um, 1632, actually, Heaven quarrelled with Gustavus. Heaven was a Catholic, Gustavus was a Protestant, and uh, on some religious matter, they didn't see eye to eye, and Heaven decided to go off and fight for a Catholic monarch. Well, that monarch was Louis XIII of France, and it was while in his service that Hepburn asked the permission of the British king, Charles I, to raise a special regiment of Scottish foot soldiers to fight abroad. The Royal Charter raising the regiment was granted at Whitehall in London. Glory has belonged to the Royal Scots ever since. Well, of course, we've been involved in practically every major campaign that the army has taken part in. Our first battle on her was at Tangier in 1680. We fought through Marlborough's campaigns and have the battle honours of his four major battles, Blenheim, Ramillies, Oudenard, Malplaquet. We had two battalions in the Crimea, the South African War, the China War of 1860, everywhere, Royal Scots everywhere. These medals in the Regimental Museum at Edinburgh Castle reflect many incidents of courage and heroism. One such incident happened during a charge at Waterloo. An officer carrying the King's colour was killed, as were three other men who took the colour in turn. The last of these was Ensign Kennedy, who was advancing at the front. He was badly wounded, but kept running. He was hit again, this time mortally. A sergeant went forward to try and get the colour back, but Kennedy was gripping it so tight uh, that he had to carry Ensign Kennedy himself back, as well as the colour. And the story goes that the French were so impressed with this bit of bravery that they ordered their soldiers to cease firing at the sergeant. It is also perhaps of interest that we have one of the descendants of 
in St. Kennedy serving in the regiment at the moment as a major. That sort of selfless dedication to duty carried on into the greatest struggle of them all. At the start of the First World War, Lord Kitchener's call to arms produced a vast expansion of the regiment from two to 35 battalions. More than 100,000 men passed through its ranks. During the war, over 11,000 Royal Scots were killed with 40,000 wounded. It's been estimated that the regiment's casualties were greater than that of the entire British Army during the Six-Year Peninsular War. The Royal Scots fought and died on the fields of France and Flanders, on the rocks and sand of Gallipoli, in Palestine, in Macedonia, and all fronts where British troops went to defend the Empire. Six out of the regiment's seven Victoria Crosses were won during the Great War, and each medal is given pride of place in the museum. Private Harry MacIver's story is one of typical bravery. Regimental records state that he performed an extraordinary feat of heroism by pursuing a German 150 yards into a machine gun nest where he killed six of the defenders and captured 20 prisoners and two machine guns. That kind of courage was displayed amid some of the worst carnage the world has ever known, and yet most of those who fought in that war tend to recall the comradeship and be rid of everything else. Oh, you know, got much time to think in France. Because you were just that one scrap into another. That was just the whole thing that was in it. We were, uh, I got, we got with leave after we went from Egypt. That was the first leave we got. Got leave from one St. Eloy in France. Then when we went back, we started with Big New. But uh, it actually, it kept you busy. You had no thought for anything else. Apart from being busy, it must have been pretty horrific. Ho, ho, ho. That's what, what could you think of nothing else? You only know one thing and uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, it was uh, very, of course, uh, even, uh, sometimes the going wasn't so bad, and otherwise it was quite good. I, I have no regrets about it, by no means. I met a lot of fun, wonderful people. Was the, the sort of camaraderie one of the, oh, the best Oh, definitely, yes, pretty cool. Absolutely, first class. You started as a private, of course. How did you work your way up through the ranks? Well, you got just you came along, I suppose. <laughs> Lots of casualties, there was vacancies. <laughs> one of the most tragic incidents in the regiment's history happened not on a battlefield, but on a border railway line on a peaceful May morning. 500 Royal Scots were on a train to Liverpool en route for the Dardanelles. But at Gretna, because of a signalman's error, their train smashed into another at full speed. It was a horrific scene with scores of dead and injured lying among mangled and blazing wreckage. Then the unthinkable happened. A third train ploughed into what was left of the other two. Afterwards, when the roll was called, only 58 answered their names. Some were helping in the rescue work, many were lying dead on the railway banks or moaning in terrible agony. Half the battalion of the 17th Royal Scots was wiped out. Only three survivors now remain, and Peter Stoddart is one of them. We arrived uh, just on the border. Of, I looked out and I said, oh, a lovely morning. And then the next thing was a crash. I landed on my face with a pile of stuff on my back, was hanging to the ground, couldn't move. But where my face was, there was a hole where I could see the light, and I smelt fresh air. I, I couldn't do anything. Then the next thing was, there was a second crash. The second crash relieved the burden of me, but my left. My left foot was crushed below the seat and was held there, but I just it round and got it lead. And it made the hole bigger, but it wasn't big enough, I thought, to get out. 
But I made a tent and I got out. I got on my feet and I walked along the line to a, to a carriage there, what they called a telescope carriage, I don't know. And it was blazing and the soldiers was trapped. They couldn't get away. They were caught in the fire. And then my leg gave way and I collapsed. What did it feel like waking up uh, to know that over 220 of your comrades had, had died in that crash? Oh, well, of course, you see, the point is this. You had no thought for anything like that, you know what I mean. You were just a matter of wondering if you were going to be right yourself. Seventy years later and another train journey south. Three generations of Royal Scots recalling past glories and past friendships. Major Melville Boucher, who was an Edinburgh man, he had a, had a war of his own in a trench uh, at rather a nasty spot in our time, in, just into Belgium, at the Gill Canal. And uh, for reasons best known to himself, he jumped into a trench and he found it already occupied by the opposition. And he just set about these gentlemen and sorted them out one by one. With his fists? Indeed. He was a big man and uh, he played off scratch and, uh, at golf. And uh, well, I reckon he hit them with number one all the way. <laughs> and we've got a very great hero, it was an Edinburgh boy, Douglas Ford, who won the George Cross as a prisoner of war. He was in Hong Kong, was taken prisoner by the Japanese and was running an intelligence service in and getting information in and out of the camp. The Japanese found out about this, but Douglas Ford refused to give away any of the information about his friends, and after an unpleasant period of interrogation and torture, he was eventually shot by the Japanese and was subsequently awarded the George Cross. And when I looked up, the German was upset. The patrol, German patrol, was uh, setting up a uh, machine gun. So having been a machine gunner myself, I thought, well, uh, better do something quick. So they're thinking very quickly at that, of course. And uh, I took on this machine gun, uh, told the lads to keep their heads down, and I was on, in the act of firing my third round when I was splattered with machine gun bullets. I got one through my left hand and one through my bicep. But bravery isn't the only thing memories are made of. There were moments of joy when the Royal Scots helped liberate towns in France, and a moment on the battlefield when firing stopped because of a little French boy. This was a summer evening when, out of the haze, appeared a young boy, I would imagine about nine years of age, in a little blue raincoat and berry, with a small biscuit tin under his arm. And it took us all by surprise. We were all around the cookhouse when this boy appeared out of the mist. So we gave him some food and tried to listen to his story. Um, he had lost his parents, and he was drifting his way back towards Bayou where he believed there was an ant of his. And in the tin box, he had a clean change of clothing, a towel, a piece of soap. And that was the whole all that that boy had in the world, really. And I thought that was one of the most courageous things I ever seen in the war. I often wonder whatever became of that little boy that appeared from the mist. Uh, my time with the 1st Battalion was uh, in India, actually. Yeah. And the train was the thing that reminds me. We once spent a whole... took us ten days going from Madras to Karachi on that train. That's when I grew my moustache, actually. Yeah. We had a competition. Very smart it is, too. <laughs> <laughs> it was very interesting, uh, as a subaltern, to be an Aden. It was the first taste of active service. And most evenings, the tribesmen up country would open up on us and fire a few rounds. We'd fire back. Honour satisfied on both sides, with few casualties. What sort, of, what sort of camaraderie existed between the Royal Scots? Oh, that was time? very nice. You got very close to your men out there because you were living with them in, in the same conditions. There, were no special, there was no special treatment or anything like that. And you got to know them really very well by talking to them on off-duty moments because there was nowhere else to go. 
The Royal Scots and their families have just returned from a two-year tour of Northern Ireland. The soldiers carried out patrols near the border with the Republic and they were on standby to reinforce the Ulster Defence Regiment in event of trouble near Armagh. For many, it was the second or third trip to the province. Well, we saw quite a bit of action since 69, since the trouble started. Uh, into Newry in 75 and back into Belfast in 80. Any major incidents? One in uh, Newry in 75, uh, we lost three Royal Scots there. And into Woodburn in Belfast in, in 80. Where we, we lost a few policemen from the REC station. Yeah. Have you less, lost any, any friends? Yes, three in uh, the Newry incident, uh, which were blasted to uh, nothing really at that time. Does that sort of incident not make you fear for your own life sometimes when you're out there? No, uh, because of the, the, the type of work we're involved in, uh, we don't actually think of it. Uh, being a soldier, we're paid as a soldier. We did patrols, etc., but we never really got involved in any incidents, you know, which, yeah, it's quite lucky, really. It depends what way you look at it, you know. Yeah. Were you expecting to be involved in I thought, uh, two years, I thought I would have seen someone, you know. You've been in uh, Northern Ireland with your husband uh, for two years. What life was it? It was fine. There was plenty of amenities and there was swimming, sports, hockey, netball for two years we were there, plenty to do. Quite nice. You sound like as if you'd rather be in Northern Ireland than back well, here. Well, there's much more in Valakinla than there is in Kirkbutton. There's nothing handy in Kirkbutton. I really enjoyed it while I was there. How do you feel about the fact that uh, your husband and yourself, obviously, are, are losing out uh, on, on wages? Well, it all depends where you go. I suppose in Germany the wages are even higher than Northern Ireland. We could just as well like to spend our time there, but we just have to go where the job takes you. Are you ever worried about your husband's safety uh, when he's serving? Of course, yeah. But when we were in Northern Ireland for two years, you see for yourself that they're not on active service all the time and you don't worry about it just as much. One probably says, well, I don't really want to go to Northern Ireland. Professionally, inside, you say, that's actually what I was trained for and I can actually go and prove what I was trained to do yes. and, and, uh, and enjoy the professional work of doing it. You still get apprehensive each time you leave. I think there's a moment of apprehension when you're told you're going on operations, uh, wherever it is in the world, and you say, golly, no more play acting, no more thinking about it, this is it. And once that passes, you get on with the training and you actually don't think about it again because you're bound up with your professional work. A two o'clock arrival at King's Cross Station and a welcome from some Royal Scots now living in London. Among the small reception party, two men who served with the regiment in the 20s, Chelsea pensioners Bob Frudd and Tommy Cosgrove. Seven in the evening and the guests begin to arrive for the birthday party. With the three service chiefs, three ambassadors and several MPs attending, security is understandably tight the press having been asked beforehand not to release details of the venue. This is something oh, marvellous in this kind of Welcoming the guests, Lieutenant General Sir Robert Richardson, an Edinburgh man who joined the Royal Scots straight from Sandhurst in 1949. Well, this occasion today, as I think you understand, is the 350th anniversary of the regiment. To the day, because it was this day in 1633, 28th March, when King Charles I signed the Royal Charter to raise this regiment. So to me, I have the honour of being the Colonel of the regiment in this 350th anniversary year. I'm the 30th Colonel, and I'm very conscious of the honour which I have. 350 years of unbroken service to the nation and to the sovereign. You enjoy yourself? Yes. Very good. A sense of history. Uh -huh. it's, uh, it's good to know that the tower you feel I'm 50 years old in that, you know. 
to you that we're actually getting to be part of what's happening, you know. Well, I think this is a very special occasion for Scotland. Uh, we have, of course, the senior infantry regiment in the whole of the British Army, the Royal Scots, here celebrating the incredible length of time of 350 years. Uh, I think it's a marvellous occasion, and it's a tribute to all the uh, people who've served in the regiment over many years and in world wars and so on. Guest of honour, the Defence Secretary, Mr. Michael Heseltine. Welcome all of you here tonight, our guests, from all members of the Royal Scots past and present. We are simply delighted that you've been able to join us this evening. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I know that on behalf of uh, all those who've been invited here this evening, you'd want to join me in thanking the Colonel of this distinguished regiment for this uh, very auspicious occasion which they've invited us to share. And I want to say at once how greatly honoured I am that I've been asked to attend the 350th anniversary of the Royal Scots. The First of Foot was formed, as you, sir, have reminded us, in 1633, when Sir John Hepburn raised a body of men in Scotland for service in France under Louis XIII. At that time, it was recognised as the premier regiment in both England and France and not uh, I think there's any surprise that caused a certain feeling of jealousy among rival French regiments who christened the Scots Pontius Pilate's bodyguard when this was put to Sir John Hepburn he replied you must be mistaken sir for had we really been the guards of Pontius Pilate and done duty at the sepulchre the holy body would never have left it <laughs> very greatest of pleasure that I now embark on the rather awesome task of cutting this cake. I'm only glad that you've left the candles behind because where I, I was capable of measuring up to the challenge of 50 candles for my own cake this week, 350 candles would be too much. of the Royal Scots, the Royal Regiment. Jock Slange Naban, Nahik Nahe, Nahik Nahe, Jock Slange. It gives me great pride to be uh, a member of the regiment, uh, one of the, the finest regiments of food. This gives you that sense of being very, very old and proud to be in something that, that just can't be matched. Nobody can match it. Well, it means a lot to me because my father was a Royal Scot. He served in the Boer War and he, he was killed in the Second and First War. And uh, it's been a sort of family tradition. All people who were in the forces had a, a love for the regiment. And um, Royal Scots are no exceptions. In fact, we're probably more maniatic about, uh, about our regiment than many others. Well, being a Royal Scot is... Uh, being proud of what the regiment has done in the past. Uh, our forefathers have uh, gained a lot of battle honours and uh, we carry them on the flag now. And that is the, uh, the whole being of the Royal Scots. It means being a member of the oldest regiment of the British Army. It's the tradition now of 350 years, being a member, being part of that tradition, that's what it means to me. Oh, marvellous, I think. Marvellous. Why is that? I would join over again if I was young. <laughs> 